Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is Rachel Heyman from Intrac. Um, welcome to this webinar. I'm the head of research at Intrac and I'm moderating this session. And so just to give you a little bit of um, background to why um, we are hosting this webinar today. So Intrac um, has been working on the impacts of aid trends on civil society organizations around the world for many years. We know it's a normal part of the aid process for um, quantities of aid to increase or to decrease over time, for donors and international NGOs to change their strategies, to change their partners, to move into new contexts and areas and to move out of others. However, in the past few years, we feel like we've seen a marked increase in the withdrawal of external support from some contexts. It includes, but it's not limited to many emerging economies. We know that this also affects fragile and post-emergency contexts and specific sectors of work. As this has happened, we've witnessed an increase in civil society organizations and funders seeking knowledge about best practice in designing, implementing and monitoring exit strategies, whether those relate to a full country exit, so a donor pulling out of an entire country, whether it relates to a project or a program exit, so where you're completing, you're ending a program or a project and moving on to other things, or whether it relates to a partner exit, so where an external actor will try to stop funding a particular um, local partner. I think the number of people um, showing an interest in this webinar is real testimony to the big dynamics that we think we're witnessing at the moment around this topic. So in track, we've been supporting a number of NGOs um, recently to improve their exit processes and to share their learning with others. And you can see our website on our website, there's a number of materials that are openly accessible and useful um, on this. What we at Intrac are particularly concerned about is the impact of aid withdrawal on the sustainability of civil society organizations that have been recipients of that external support. And we're concerned about how the way in which aid um, is withdrawn affects their functions, their activities, and the impacts of their work. We have reached out to practitioners, to donors, to researchers, to evaluators around the world to share knowledge and to foster better practice in exit planning for the long term sustainability of organizations and their impacts. This webinar is the latest in a series of such activities um, and activities that we have organized and been involved in with partners and like minded organizations. We want to ensure that learning is shared and ultimately we want to bring about some change in behavior around exit and sustainability. We feel like we've made some progress in this, particularly in our understanding of INGOs and donors and how they approach exit. And our basic finding from this is that there is quite a lot that we think needs to be done to change. We feel there is, however, a big gap in our evidence and knowledge about the experience of partners, the experience of those who are on the receiving end of these exit processes. And we're really hoping that this webinar is one way that we might begin to generate some momentum in order to address that gap. <clears throat> So I thought we would try and start with, and I don't, I'm hoping this will work. Um, we have, as you, you can see, a lot of people in the room. Um, we know that some of you come from um, civil society organizations, some of you from international NGOs, from funders, from donor institutions, et cetera, et cetera. It's very hard to get all of you to introduce yourselves. And I think it's great that so many of you have been introducing yourselves using the chat box. Um, I'm going to try a couple of quick polls so that we can see, you can get a sense of who you all are. I know, but you don't. So um, I'm going to put up a quick poll. The questions are on the screen now. So I want you to select the number one to five, which you think best describes you. Um, I know this is a bit crude. I only had five options. I couldn't do a number six. So I hope you can fit yourself into one of these categories. If you can't, then um, please, uh, please don't do it. Don't do a chat box. I'm going to set up a poll. 
Go ahead now. <laughs> Fantastic. So hopefully you can, can you see the responses? Yes, hopefully you can now see the responses on your screen. Um, 36 of you come from international NGOs. That's quite interesting. Five of you are consultants. Um, we have a few people from local level organizations and some people who say the poll doesn't work. Okay, if I, can you try again? Anybody who didn't before? Okay, anyway, it's a, it's a brilliant exercise, I think, and just seeing who we might have in the room gives you a bit of a sense. Um, thank you. So, um, right. so now we're gonna move on to a second poll, which is, um, What brings us together? So again, just hold on a minute before you actually start making your choices. Um, for this one, we have four choices. I would like you to think about what best describes your situation. So firstly, do you, so what best describes your situation? Are you planning, managing, or delivering an exit strategy? Secondly, are you on the receiving end of an exit process? Thirdly, are you supporting organizations to cope with aid withdrawal? Fourthly, do you have another reason? <laughs> and please, you can use the chat box um, to do that. I'll give you a minute just to have a think about those questions. You should be able to just click on the number on the poll. Okay, that's great. I'm going to show you the responses, which means you probably can't. Um, now make any changes. So we can see that part we have around about 30 people of our 75. So maybe a third of you are in the process of pl are planning, managing or delivering exit strategies. We have a couple of people in the room who are on the receiving end. So we'll be really interested to hear your perspective and your voice during um, this webinar. We have uh, about a quarter of our participants who are supporting organizations who are going through this process and there's a few more reasons in the chat box fantastic um, so thank you very much I hope that gives you a flavor of who you are and why you're here and we will um, continue to sort of think about these things as we go along. I have um, a colleague sitting next to me who is jotting down things that are coming up in the chat box as we go along. So I'm hoping that we can make sure we're picking up all of the things that you're writing about as we go. Okay, let me end that. Okay, so I want to move on to our first presentation because um, I think that's what many of you have come here to, to hear about. So I would like to um, invite Chris Palas to um, switch on his microphone and um, take us through his presentation. Chris will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and answers and you can always ask you know make your points write your questions in the chat box as we go along and we'll try and pick up as many of those as we can during um, the chat session okay thank you thank you very much Rachel um, so just to clarify Rachel do I flip my own slides or do you guys flip them I've, I'm sure you told me but I'm I've, I've forgotten <laughs> no you can you can flip them you should be able to do that okay all right Thank you very much. Um, so just to introduce myself very briefly, um, my name is Christopher Pallas. I'm an associate professor at Kennesaw State University, uh, which is located outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. Um, and I first became interested in aid reduction and its impact on local civil society organizations 
when I was working in Vietnam, working in Hanoi in uh, the summer of 2012. And basically local organizations that were supporting me and doing some other unrelated research asked me to begin researching aid reduction as well because it was something that was uh, beginning to impact them and they really didn't know what the outcomes were going to be. And so they asked me to include that in my research agenda and with the assistance of um, a Vietnamese NGO staffer named Lan Nguyen, um, I began to, to research this topic. And so some of the outcomes from that research are what I'll be sharing with you this morning. So just to give you a brief overview of the presentation, um, <clears throat> the, uh, we'll, I'll begin by sharing a little bit about civil society in Vietnam, just to give some context for, for my discussion of aid reduction. Uh, then we'll actually talk about the aid reduction and its impacts, how organizations are adapting to aid reduction, and then what I think some of the key findings are in terms of uh, things that we might think about beyond the Vietnamese context. So civil society in Vietnam. If you've done any work in Vietnam, you'll understand that in these next couple of slides, I'm just scratching the surface. The Vietnamese uh, uh, CSO sector is very complex. Um, and uh, the things that I'm going to talk about today are just the things that are necessary to frame, uh, to frame the discussion of aid reduction. So one thing that's important to understand is that there are two different types of CSOs operating in Vietnam amongst the local civil society organizations, two different types that are relevant for our discussion. There's a third type, which is government sponsored, but that's not relevant for what we're discussing today. So there are the Vietnamese non-governmental organizations. Uh, these are organizations that are registered with the government. And then there are the community-based organizations which are unregistered. So the VNGOs have to pass some significant hurdles in order to be registered with the government. Um, in Hanoi, they have to have five college educated staff, a certain amount of cash on hand, a permanent physical address. Um, and as a result, they are highly professionalized organizations. Um, and there aren't very many of them. Um, then there are the community-based organizations. There are lots of community-based organizations and they exist in the legal gray area. They are unregistered organizations and they are typically uh, created by members of the beneficiary population. So by commercial sex workers or by family members of people living with HIV AIDS. So they tend to be very strongly grass rooted, uh, grass, grass rooted, if that's a word, they tend to be very, uh, very strongly rooted in the beneficiary population, but they also tend to be relatively weak and unstable organizations. Um, in addition, it's uh, important to know that the political environment for civil society organizations in Vietnam is challenging. Uh, the government is um, uh, uncertain about the, um, the value of civil society. The government sees civil society, at least in the VNGO and CBO forms, as, um, as a Western import, essentially. And is also kind of leery about the role of civil society in the color revolutions a few years back, and so sees that civil society as a potential threat. Um, that's resulted in this high degree of regulation. And then, of course, the government uh, is not very friendly towards the populations that are most likely to be impacted by HIV AIDS in Vietnam, which include commercial sex workers and injection drug users. And so that's an additional hurdle that uh, organizations working in the sector have to face uh, when they're dealing with the government. So in part because of this sort of government ambivalence, it's really international players that have had an outsized role in, uh, in what's going on in Vietnam. So by international players, we're talking about the usual cast of characters. We've got bilateral and multilateral donors, technical agencies, international NGOs, and for-profit implementers. Obviously, there are lots of differences between these different groups, uh, but uh, I'm going to refer to them in a, in a very broad brushstroke way as donors, because these are all groups that are bringing money to the field, either their own money or somebody else's money. Um, and that money has been very si significant in Vietnam. Um, it's really helped fuel the growth of the sector. A quotation from uh, one of the respondents. Um, I think that there's somebody who has their mic on who might want to turn it off, um, by the way. There's a button on the bottom, you can turn it off. Um, so uh, this is a quotation. Originally, we operated on a very small scale based on the needs of several people, and we didn't really want anyone to know back then. After meeting with a number of donors, they made us realize that if we continue to work, but on a larger scale, we can reach more people and create a larger impact. And with the support of donors, we've become more professional. And that's a very typical story 
um, in uh, amongst CSOs in Vietnam. And then additionally, donors have provided a lot of political support. They've lobbied the government to basically change the laws to give CBOs recognition, to allow different kinds of funding. Um, and donors have even pressured the government to use VNGOs and CBOs as implementers for government programs. So that's the general context. Now, in light of this kind of very big role that international donors have played, it is, uh, again, um, unsurprising that aid reduction and the withdrawal of donors would have a big impact on the sector. So in, 2000, in 2009, uh, Vietnam achieved middle income status. Um, and around the same time, of course, donors were really feeling the effects of the global financial crisis and beginning to think about reallocating uh, resources elsewhere. Vietnam was doing well economically um, and also doing well fighting HIV AIDS. So um, as a result, um, two of the biggest donors in the sector, the US-based PEPFAR and the Global Fund, uh, began uh, a process of pulling back. So PEPFAR right now is expected to end funding within the next five years. Um, and Global Fund is requiring the Vietnamese government to provide 20% of the annual response funding for HIV AIDS. And previously, PEPFAR and the Global Fund basically between them funded essentially 100% um, of the Vietnamese government's uh, HIV AIDS response. Uh, there are foreign donors that are leaving Vietnam altogether. The Dutch are out, uh, Ford and Rockefeller are out. Um, and then, uh, at least the last, the last that I've heard. Um, and then uh, other donors are leaving the HIV AIDS sector and focusing on other issues in Vietnam. And so that includes groups like the World Bank and DFID and Clinton Health. Um, and from the, um, from the civil society perspective, all of this feels really fast. So again, this is a, a quotation here at the bottom. The World Bank DFID, they just leave basically. There's no transition plan. At least PEPFAR is putting in a transition plan in five years to do that. But again, it's been very abrupt. So this sort of uh, abrupt or rapid departure is having a lot of impacts on the sector. So um, the, the most obvious, of course, is that the organizations themselves are affected. So organizations are cutting back staff or thinking about cutting back staff um, some uh, the CBOs, as I mentioned, they really come up from the grassroots, and so they don't have uh, professional NGO type staffers. They have people who used to be volunteers that have come and now work for the organization professionally. And you know, one of the organizations that I spoke for spoke with one of the leaders said, you know, I've been telling the members that are working for us now to go back to their old employers and to see if they can get their old jobs back. And if they can get their old jobs back, then I tell them to come back as volunteers. Um, so some organizations are already cutting back on staff. Um, and then services to beneficiary populations are also being cut as well. So again, here's a quotation. Three years ago, we always had some sort of money set aside to give to the groups in other provinces so that they can carry out their very basic duties like meetings and communications. But right now we don't have that money anymore. So, so things like public education and destigmatization campaigns, these things are, are uh, being affected by the loss of donor funds. And then lastly, there's this loss of political support because while donors have really been uh, pushing the government to change various laws and to support civil society more heavily, that, that work is all sort of in progress. Nothing's been locked down yet. The, the, the legislation and the policy changes that donors have pushed haven't been passed. Um, and so this is, again, this is a, a VNGO response. The effort of the last 10 years will be destroyed. In the last 10 years, of course, the recognition of the government to this issue of CSOs has been increased, but only in recognition of the issue, not in terms of policy strategies and investment. So these are some of the direct impacts. There are also some indirect impacts that I wanna highlight. Um, ways that the that the overall environment for civil society uh, organizations is changing. So one of the indirect impacts is an increase in competition between organizations. Basically, as there's less donor funding to go around, organizations anticipate having to compete with one another for the remaining funding. So you've got VNGOs versus other VNGOs. Also, you have VNGOs potentially versus international NGOs. Because the, the VNGOs are fairly professionalized, what some of them have said, have said are, you know, we may actually scale up in order to be able to capture funding that was previously captured by uh, INGOs. We'll stop being subcontractors and we'll try to be primes. Um, so that's uh, so there, there's another level of competition being introduced. Um, 
obviously this kind of competition exacerbates the existing problems with coordination in the sector. There's a lot of things that I could say about coordination issues in the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam's civil society sector that we don't have time to get into, but there are coordination issues and the competition only makes them worse. Um, doing good advocacy also requires critical mass, which usually requires coordination. And so it may also make advocacy problems, uh, ad problems with advocacy effectiveness worse if coordination goes downhill. Um, <clears throat> there's also an issue with uh, decreasing CSO agency. Uh, basically, organizations, local organizations used to be able to pick and choose amongst grants and pick and choose amongst donors, um, enabled, and that enabled them to maintain a beneficiary-focused mission. But of course, when there are fewer grants to go around, that tends to give donors more power and uh, CSOs less power. And so there's a certain concern that there's going to be less of a, a, of a grassroots or locally driven mission and more of a donor-driven mission. So the question then becomes, how is it that local organizations are adapting to this? How is it the local organizations uh, and, and donors, I should say, um, are adapting to the age reduction? So I'm gonna put up a slide here with a lot of text. These are all of the responses, all of the solutions that I heard from both people on the donor side and the local CSO side. And uh, some of these are already being implemented. Some of these are just proposed um, and they fall into some general categories. So one of them is, one general category is kind of replacing existing donor funding with new, uh, with new but very similar donor funding. So uh, there, it's possible to encourage the government to fund VNGOs, to encourage the government to fund CBOs. Of course, that would require better legal recognition for the CBOs, um, or to build the capacity of CSOs to apply for other external funding, basically help them to, to find other, other places where they can apply for grants and to win those grants. Then there's a second uh, kind of cluster, which is basically about reducing costs, being able to do more with us, do more with the money that's left. So this includes laying off staff for what in the United States we sometimes call kind of right sizing, matching the size of the organization to the revenues available, um, replacing paid staff with volunteers, um, and also some discussion even in spite of what I mentioned on the previous slide, some discussion of developing better coordination with CSOs, at least in order to increase their advocacy efficiency. There's uh, an additional cluster of kind of uh, cultivating new, uh, kind of generating, cultivating new sources of, uh, of donor support um, from within Vietnam. So one, uh, one thought is to tap foreign private sector resources. Basically, there are a lot of foreign businesses that are working in Vietnam and see if some of them would become donors for the civil society sector. And then, of course, as Vietnam has industrialized, there are, there are a lot of Vietnamese that have become very wealthy. And so there's the thought that maybe these Vietnamese can be mobilized as supporters for the sector. And then lastly, but certainly uh, certainly very important, there's the thought that the organizations, the CSOs themselves, could generate their own revenue streams. So, uh, so many of the organizations, especially at the CBO level, are already involved in social enterprises. So they are selling paper goods, they're sewing clothing, things like that. VNGOs have said maybe we can uh, move into social enterprise as well by offering consulting services or research services. Um, and then I think perhaps one of the most interesting responses that I heard um, was from a CBO that said actually that they would go into the private healthcare sector. Um, a lot of CBOs provide uh, uh, healthcare already. They provide home-based detox programs and HIV AIDS testing, things like that. And, uh, and so uh, they could provide those services on a fee basis, basically moving into the private healthcare sector that exists in Vietnam. The thing that's striking is the difference in who favors which solution. So donors, their number one solution far and away is government funding, government funding, government funding. Um, here's a quotation. We would, what we would like to see is that the cuts in international donor support would induce the Vietnamese government to make more use of civil society organizations to provide services. So donors know that civil society organizations provide these services well, and they think that the government should see the light and start funding civil society organizations. Donors also want to build CSO's grant writing and fundraising capacity, um, and they have some interest in the social enterprise angle as well. 
Now, VNGOs, they've got a totally different perspective on this. Uh, the VNGOs uh, did not know uh, when, uh, until I started doing this research, many of them said that they really did not know that the donors were expecting that they would sort of hand them off to the government. And when I started kind of playing this, uh, you know, kind of shuttle role, talking with both sides, the VNGOs said they found that solution to be totally surreal. Um, one of the old hands in the sector basically said, the government thinks that um, that every dollar that has ever been given to VNGOs um, or to CBOs is a dollar that should have been given to the government for its own HIV AIDS response. And so basically the government feels like the civil society sector has been stealing from the government. And so what this respondent said is the government would never give money to someone who already took money out of their pocket. Um, so VNGOs, their solutions include doing more grant writing and fundraising. They strongly favor that. Also um, social enterprises, um, are a, um, a very frequently mentioned response. Um, and then they also have these ideas about mobilizing local donors. And I even spoke with some VNGO leaders that were in the process of trying to set up um, what I think was the first Vietnamese charitable foundation to support uh, civil society activities in Vietnam. Um, and then CBOs, again, they've got a totally different perspective on this issue. Um, the CBOs, again, they're coming up from the grassroots and they're not really concerned with, uh, with fading away or, or closing up as, as organizations um, as long as the needs of their members are met. And then, of course, they're also big on the social enterprise angle. So again, this is a quote from a CBO leader saying, people with HIV, they want a normal life. They don't want to create a particular group just for them. They just want to integrate into society and live like normal people. In the next four to five years, such groups like my organization and other marginalized populations, they will continue to disappear. Um, and that's not a problem. That's basically what this leader conveyed. So naturally, that poses this kind of uh, disjuncture, um, poses a question regarding, oh, there we go, uh, re regarding why this disconnect exists. Um, I think that one of the main reasons that uh, the disconnect exists between donors and local CSOs is that the consultations that the donors have conducted um, with local CSOs have been very narrow. Um, basically, when I spoke with donors about their, their program, program design and exit strategies, they were very consistently drafted abroad. They were drafted in New York and DC and London. Um, they weren't being drafted in consultation with Vietnamese organizations. The consultations that existed were about how to implement the exit strategy, but not on what the exit strategy should be. Um, and I think there was also an issue of essentially differing priorities. Um, the donor's number one priority was to preserve the development gains, to preserve the gains that have been made against HIV AIDS. And they, uh, they, I think they saw, to a large extent, they saw the government as sort of the strong arm that could preserve those gains. Um, and the NGOs, uh, they, they care about the beneficiary populations and they want to preserve the gains made against the disease. Um, but at the same time, the NGOs have really come to self-consciously identify themselves as local civil society. And uh, in part because of donor tutelage, they, they see local civil society as being inherently important and they want to see local civil society preserved. Um, CBOs, again, different perspective. Um, they want to, to meet stakeholder needs pretty much full stop. Um, they come from this sort of hard scrabble up from the ground background and whatever's going to work is what they're going to do. Um, they just want to maximize feasibility. Um, in some of the background of this, I think there may be a, a subtle theme of basically donor devaluation of local civil society. Um, donors have paid a lot of lip service to the importance of a healthy civil society um, for the overall health of the society and as part of maybe future democratization efforts. Um, but even though donors pay a lot of lip service to this, it seems like donors don't really understand the extent to which they've succeeded in that goal. Um, that uh, a lot of the CSOs in Vietnam are very dedicated, very high capacity, um, but donors seem to persist in seeing CSOs primarily as implementing agents that can't carry out the core missions without somebody else, whether it's the international donors or the government, to guide them or advise them in that process. So what are the consequences? So short term, I think the consequences in Vietnam are probably pretty negative. Um, I think there's, there's going to be a loss of essential services for some of the beneficiary population. Um, there's not a lot of indication that the handoff to the government is going to go very smoothly. Um, there's a potential for increased government repression in, in the sector. 
um, I mean, both towards CSOs and probably towards beneficiary populations. Um, and probably decreasing agency um, uh, amongst local CSOs and decreasing connection between them as uh, funding decreases and competition, in competition increases. So basically, the, there's a short-term risk to local civil society and to beneficiary populations. Um, but I also see a lot of long-term potential um, because th I think that there's the, the potential for diversified funding and uh, as a result, increasing financial independence. There's the possibility of cultivating uh, indigenous donors or at least local donors, whether it's foreign businesses or Vietnamese citizens. And then also a renewal of volunteer culture, which I think makes organizations uh, more connected to the local population. So long term, I actually think that withdrawal or aid reduction may enhance local control over CSOs and may create a more mature, sustainable and independent local civil society. So I know that we're really right at about the 20 minutes here. So I'm just going to hit a few points quickly regarding things that might be relevant outside of Vietnam. Um, so one, uh, a few things to consider are that the, the consequences of aid reduction, they go beyond the financial. It's not just the risks to the projects. It's, uh, it's also changes in dynamics within the sector um, and changes uh, in dynamics between civil society organizations and the government that need to be considered. Um, the range of adaptations is actually quite large. I mean, we've got that whole list of, of nine different potential adaptations. Um, and many of those adaptations, they come from the grassroots. They're coming from the local level. They're not coming from the international level. Um, so it's important that people who are operating on the international level tap into that local creativity. Um, and uh, in light of that, it's, it's also problematic um, the, that there's a potential for a disconnect between donors and local CSOs. And so uh, attention needs to be paid to how to resolve that disconnect. So um, there are a few other notes here um, in terms of planning for aid reduction, and they really just reiterate some things that I've already said, um, that the outcomes depend upon the mitigation strategies chosen. Um, in order to develop a, a successful transition strategy, donors need to think about preserving local civil society, not just preserving development objectives. Um, there needs to be better consultation and engagement with local CSOs during that process. Um, and I think additional research, including um, this, the sorts of work that INTRAC is doing and that we're doing here at Kennesaw State, and we're doing some work with the U.S. Institute of Peace, additional research can actually help improve this policy process. So I've, uh, I've got some additional resources here that I've got on the next slide. Um, and you all are also, of course, welcome to contact me about any of these things. But I'll stop there so I don't cut any further into our discussion time. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. That was great. And I hope everybody could hear as clearly as I could that um, really interesting case study uh, from Vietnam. So we now have um, some time for sort of questions or answers or discussion um, that so that you can raise, uh, you the participants can raise any questions you have specifically for Chris at the moment before we move on to our second presentation. So um, you can either ask questions in the chat box or you're welcome to raise your hand using the little hand button. Um, hopefully we won't have 78 people trying to raise their hand at the same time. But um, so if you want to raise your hand and speak, please do. If not, um, Chris, I encourage you to look at the chat box, start reading so through the questions that are coming in and um, uh, think about responding. Um, it's probably worth gathering a couple of questions um, before you, you respond. So does anybody want to raise their hand? So Belisario, I see you have your hand up. Could you switch your microphone on and ask your question, please? So Belisario, you need to switch your microphone on. We can't hear you. Uh, Rachel, maybe while that's being figured out, I see that there's a question in the chat box also from Lydia. Um, I'll respond to that briefly. So Lydia has asked, uh, when donors and CSOs discovered the disconnect, what happened? Um, and the answer on that, unfortunately, is is not a lot. Um, uh, basically, the the policies had already been set, and the local the local agents in Vietnam were really implementing things that had been in turn handed to them 
by people outside Vietnam. And so they didn't actually have a lot of scope to change the policies that, that they were working on. There was one exception to that that I'm going to have to talk about a little bit opaquely um, to, to not violate anybody's confidentiality. Um, but there was one major donor that did have actually a very innovative um, process that really was focused on civil society sustainability and not just HIV AIDS sustainability. Um, and they, uh, yeah, they had a, a lot of very innovative ideas. And uh, when I checked in about them, um, uh, after the research was completed, I think within about two years, they had had to leave Vietnam and there were some some rumors that essentially they had been squeezed out. Um, and I probably can't say much more about that. So the, the bottom line is that uh, when, when people heard about the disconnect, they were already kind of stuck in a place of sort of path dependency and they weren't able to make a lot of changes. Um, okay, Benasari, you still have your hand up. Um, have you worked out how to um, switch your microphone on? If not, I have uh, somebody else with their hand up. I need to find out who that is. Um, Krishna, would you like to put on your microphone and ask your question, please? Thank you so much for the nice presentation. My question is, who can play in playing role for oil exit plan with the uh, ingo or ngo who can play uh, who can play a interesting role major role either by ingo or ngo hello ah, thank you yes uh, i hear you so who can play kind of the lead role ingos or or, yeah. or ngos um I think I'm going to try to bundle that question actually with the question that's been uh, posed by Hans in the chat box, which is when do you start discussing the need for an exit strategy from the onset? So in addition to this research that we did in Vietnam, um, I've been doing some research with the U.S. Institute of Peace where we've been looking at uh, a donor withdrawal um, in post-conflict countries. And we did a workshop in D.C. last November, and the consensus coming out of that workshop was that the um, – oh, maybe you could mute your microphone while I'm answering. I think that might eliminate some background noise. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so the consensus coming out of that, that workshop was really that the um, – in order to have effective, an effective, uh, an exit strategy, you had to start planning for uh, for exit really from the moment of donor entry. That some of the problems that are encountered in civil society sustainability are problems that are, of course, induced by the ways that donors come into the country. Um, and so, uh, I would say that the the first role, um, not the most important role, perhaps, but the first role that has to be played is is probably by international donors. To, to think about sustainability when they're coming into the country um, and to start planning for sustainability um, you know, from, from the very outset. Now, probably the, now the local civil society side of that, of course, is, is equally important, even if local civil society perhaps forms, uh, takes a responsive role, at least initially. And local civil society, of course, has to then be feeding appropriate information um, into the process so that uh, sustainability pro uh, sustainability strategies are developed in an effective fashion. I don't know if that's a little bit vague. I'd be happy to elaborate, um, but that's just sort of a, a high level a high level response. So, Chris, there is a lot of questions sort of coming into the the chat box. Um, Maybe we have one Dile who's raised her ha his, her his hand. <laughs> so, one Dile, would you like to ask, switch on your microphone, ask the question, then please switch your microphone off again afterwards. Chris, in the meantime, you can perhaps scroll a little bit up and down the chat box and see what you can see. Okay. Hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, um, this is Wandle. Thank you very much, Chris, for the presentation. What I'd like to say is probably a comment where you stated that there is a need to renew the volunteer culture. So I just wanted to ask, do you feel that the lack of the volunteer culture is actually dependent on the context? Because I'll speak for myself, living here in Zimbabwe, working with young people, that culture is almost at zero level. Do you feel that it's mostly dependent on the place where the person stays. To say maybe in the Southern Africa, in South America, the volunteer culture is still there, or is it something that is generic all over? 
Thank you. That's Sorry, a great Chris, question. Uh, Chris, before you start, can I just ask could, whoever it is that's moving the slides around, can you stop, please? Thank you. Chris, go ahead. Uh, I think that's a great question. It's it's probably not one that I'm fully qualified to answer insofar as I don't actually know what the volunteer cultures look like everywhere. Um, I do think that there really is a culture of, of civil society, a kind of grassroots civil society that starts with volunteers in many places. Um, I've worked in West Africa in addition to doing work in Vietnam and have certainly seen a lot of, um, of kind of grassroots organizations that are created by people who are getting no money to run those organizations. Um, but that being said, just because I've seen it in a couple places doesn't mean that it exists everywhere. And like you're saying, in your context, maybe there isn't a place um, for, there, there isn't a, a local sense of, of uh, kind of the value for volunteering. So there probably are adaptations that are different in different contexts. Um, and I also want to say just sort of as a caveat that, um, that while I think volunteer culture is important, it's important also that donors not think about volunteers as people who would do the work of a professional for free. Um, I think that sometimes from a donor perspective, because uh, donors recognize that, say, local opportunities for paid work are scarce, um, because there may not be a big formal sector, um, that, uh, that donors think, well, since the opportunity cost is low, um, why not just expect people to do the work for free? Um, and that's not the sort of thing I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people kind of trying to run a whole NGO um, on no money. Um, but I do think that if there is a local culture that allows people to participate to the tune of, you know, two hours, five hours, you know, a week, 10 hours a month, something like that um, in, uh, in NGO activities or CSO activities, um, I think that that's something that really can help keep the organization connected to its beneficiaries and help keep the beneficiaries invested in the work of the organization. All right, thank you very much. So Chris, I'd encourage you to um, pick up maybe a couple of other um, points in the chat box. Um, I think there was an interesting point from Emmanuel, um, from Belisario, from Mary. So please, I mean, maybe just pick up on two or three other things before we move on to the next presentation. Sure. Um, I'll try to maybe answer uh, answer these in the in the in the um, the order that they're coming. So uh, I see here from Frederick. Um, was it a good idea to use economic indicators like middle income status as a trigger for withdrawal? Um, how will that affect the poor beneficiary? Um, I would say I am skeptical about using middle income status as a trigger for withdrawal, um, in part because obviously economic gains are not evenly distributed within a country and the people who are probably most in need of civil society help are probably the people who have benefited least from, uh, from economic increases. Um, and also there's a difference between having more money in the country, like having a, a strong middle class and having um, a middle class or an upper class that is willing to give towards, uh, towards charitable organizations. So I think that probably, at least if donors are concerned about civil society sustainability, there need to be some more refined metrics um, that go beyond middle income status that deal with things like, I mean, we need to consider things like distribution of wealth and then also whether or not, for instance, there are legal structures in place um, to facilitate charitable giving. Um, so that's, uh, that's my answer there. And let me get, let's see, we've got Emmanuel's question. Um, to what extent does aid withdrawal affect funding modalities which have a direct effect on how, uh, on how NGOs can mobilize resources? Um, Emmanuel, if you uh, could turn on your mic, I'd love to hear you maybe elaborate on that question a little bit. I'm not sure that I understand all of the pieces of it. So I'll mute and maybe if you want to elaborate, we'll give you a moment for that. Emmanuel, are you going to switch on your microphone and speak? It may be that, Chris, he doesn't have a microphone available, but let's give him a second. Okay, well, Emmanuel, if you want to elaborate in the chat box, I'll watch for it.
Okay, Chris, I have another hand raised from Gideon, so perhaps we will um, ask him to, to speak and then uh, if that's okay. So Gideon, switch on your microphone and go ahead, please. Yes, sir, I, was, I would like to ask on, there's a, a, st a statement which I've seen on the slide saying the government will never give money to the people who already took money out of their pockets. I haven't understood this statement. What does it mean? Please, Christopher, may, may you tell me? So what is the what is the context for that statement? Um, it was the the fund fundraise no the oh, oh it's I, it it may be a, a dynamic that is specific to Vietnam um, where basically in part because Vietnam is a communist country the government feels like it has responsibility for the well-being of its citizens and it should be the primary spokesperson for its citizens and so there's a, a certain sense that donors should really deal exclusively with the government and not give money directly to NGOs. Um, and so this, the idea then is that kind of any money that has been given to NGOs is money that NGOs effectively took out of the government's pocket. It's not that the government, that's not that NGOs actually took money from the government, it's that the government feels like donor money to NGOs is money that NGOs took from the government. Um, so I think that that feeling is fairly strong in Vietnam. But I think that there are probably other countries in which the development of parallel structures has generated similar tensions between governments and the civil society sector, which is one of the reasons why I mention it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chris, we've probably got time for you to maybe respond to one other question if you want to identify something that you feel you haven't said already and you'd like to really pick up on. Um, and then uh, we will have time to come back to other points and questions at the end of the session as well. Okay. So I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through the questions here and there are so many interesting. Um, let's see. Um, I'm, uh, I'm looking at uh, Adidas right now. So exit strategy is scientific in any project right from the beginning of the project design. It is well articulated in the project cycle management. Um, how then the phase out becomes or looks, uh, how is it basically the, uh, that the phase out becomes or looks terrifying to, to project managers and beneficiaries? I think that's actually gonna be a theme for, for our discussion and, and something that can be part of the group discussion later. I think that one of the things that I would probably ask in return um, is to what extent do the organizations that are on the call actually think about their exit strategy? I mean, the things that I've heard, at least in my conversation so far, is that a lot of the exit strategy stuff is, is really quite boilerplate. I mean, to the point that it's almost cut and pasted between different grant applications. So on the one hand, it's scientific in the sense that it's all logical and drawn out, but uh, there's a difference between being scientific and being um, kind of context appropriate. And I think that the, the difference between those things should not be overlooked. So why don't I stop there, Rachel? Okay, that's brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, Chris. That was really, really a, a great um, sort of entry to this discussion and already generating a huge amount of, of super discussion, despite the uh, the numbers of people, which often pe can be a little bit intimidating, actually. Um, huge number of, I know, other points and comments that were made within the chat box. We will attempt to sort of run our way back through those during the next presentation and make sure we highlight um, in the final discussion any points that we um, feel have not been addressed yet and then maybe Chris can come back to them or maybe some of them will be addressed in our next presentation um, so we'll see how that goes so thank you again Chris and now I'm going to move on and ask uh, Yindra and Laurie to do their presentation um, again Laurie Yindra you've got the the, the permission to move the slides um, so please switch on your microphone. I don't know how you're planning to do it between the two of you, but if you switch on your microphones and go ahead. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank um, you, Rachel. Can sorry, everyone sorry hold me? on a minute. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, I think your microphone was still on if you would just switch it off. Great. Yindra, go ahead. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Splendid. Splendid. So just a little bit, Lori and I have been around for quite a few years uh, working as evaluators in international development, designing projects. Um, Lori's been implementing them. Um, and so uh, we 
I founded Valuing Voices in 2013 uh, just as a, a first a curiosity about what exit strategies exist and how many projects have been evaluated after, um, after closeout and it's become my life's work right now and Laurie joined me last year. So our three, I'll have Laurie introduce herself as well. Laurie, would you like to say something now before we go? Hi everyone. It's, that's fine, Yandra. I think you did you did a great job. Okay, terrific. Actually, I know that uh, Vietnam has a special place in Laurie's heart because she was, she was, she was a country. Um, and I have to say to Chris, it's really there's so many things that resonated. Like 20 years ago, I was I was trying to help CSOs uh, phase out because the donor. Uh, U.S. government donor was, was phasing out, and it was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. All, all about the disconnects and the narrow consultations and the devaluation really rang true. So uh, we'd like to introduce you folks to sustained and what we're calling right now draft draft calling sustained emerging impact evaluation, the benefits for exit country development, key findings from a variety of uh, evaluations we've done in Africa or know that others have done and really talk about how can we both build the evidence base and advocate for it in your countries and, uh, and projects. So here are come some shocking statistics. 137 billion was spent in 2014 alone on development projects. Five trillion dollars has been spent since 1945 but we're not sure if what we're doing is actually sustainable. There are these beautiful sustainable development goals. Um, and while there are indicators, I've looked into it a bit uh, recently, while there's a hundred uh, rolled up indicators and so forth, there are some structural issues because the, um, the indicators are, to the best of my knowledge, measuring um, uh, things that are disconnected necessarily from projects coming and going. There is no evaluation of the sustainability of the projects themselves after closeout. So we keep having lots of slices of time, you know, snapshots in a slice of time. Um, so really, I, I promise you, after three years of looking at thousands of what are called ex post or post project um, documents, the vast majority of them say we should do it. Uh, we have found fewer than 1% of projects have ever been evaluated. So for instance, in the USAID DEC, the Development Experience Clearinghouse, there are a thousand documents that are tagged as post-project or ex-post evaluations. And in the last 20 years, only 12 of them actually involved going out to the field, talking to people. Um, globally, uh, we found only 23 international development organizations that have done any evaluation of sustained impact. Now, what we're saying is not impact evaluations. This is different from the 3IE, uh, the International Institute for Impact Evaluation. Their impact is really evaluating during the project or the effect at the end of the project. There is what we're talking about is after the projects close. And even more surprisingly, very rarely are project participants consulted. Many of the post project evaluations that are done are desk studies. Um, the exceptions are JICA. Um, which has 200, you'll see later, but JICA, OECD, ADB has a new one, and there are some NGOs. Uh, my favorite uh, post-project is one that we did uh, for CRS, so um, I'll share that, so that's why they're down there. But there are also, uh, I think, about uh, 15 international NGOs that have actually done at least one, one post-project evaluation. So participants, taxpayers, and investors simply deserve better. Um, when we think about, you know, we talk about sustainable development, and we really do assume there's a vast amount of assumptions in terms of the sustainability of our programming. But as evaluators, we say, well, what's the proof? And so, um, so that's where we are. Uh, this is far more detailed than you're probably interested in, but uh, JICA's done over 200 
OECD have done several hundred. And under that OECD, I've come to see that there are European organizations that have funded post-project evaluations. But it's about, you know, maybe 150, maybe 200 maximum. Uh, many of them end at the stakeholder level. They don't get down to the participants. They'll end at the district level or at the, um, you know, the national capital or maybe district. Um, a shockingly few actually go down to ask the ultimate recipients of aid what they were able to self-sustain. There's this wonderful, wonderful book that I forgot to put in this presentation. It's called Time to Listen. They went back to, I believe, 6,000 organizations around the world. And they asked, um, this is Mary Anderson of uh, Rising from the Ashes. Mary Anderson, a brilliant, brilliant researcher. Um, they asked what, uh, what ordinary participants felt about uh, aid and uh, how much did it serve them? What would they like differently? And the number one lesson from it is they all want to participate. They all want to be part of it. They don't want aid to be done to them, uh, which is uh, along the lines of Chris's presentation in terms of civil society. And it takes time. It often takes a far longer time than we have the luxury of doing. Uh, in US international nonprofits, one of the shocks that I've come, that I've been rather flabbergasted by is that um, U.S. Uh, INGOs have actually used their own private funds to do 10 evaluations of USAID projects. So USAID has spent between, uh, I believe it's between 20 and 100 million dollars on these massive projects. Uh, small or large U.S. NGOs are using their own private funds to evaluate them. Um, USAID has, however, in the last 24 months done two. So they did nothing for a large number of years. They did many, many in the 70s, 80s. They stopped for about uh, 20 years or did just really a handful. And the international NGOs have come in to fill the gap. Um, uh, very surprisingly, you know, the EU Commission, there's a handful of transportation projects that have been evaluated, even though $1.4 trillion has been spent, according to ODAC. Um, obviously, some of the OECD ones fall under the EU, so it's a bit unclear, but it's really been shocking to me how few are publicly available. They may be done, but we just can't find them. I've already talked about USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation that's known for impact uh, and looking at, uh, they told Congress they would look at these you know, post project. While they're relatively new, uh, we only found two evaluations that were publicly available, a very small Central American road projects. The World Bank was most shocking. I had a researcher uh, in my firm look at uh, several hundred documents, only 33 post-project evaluations were done. And in only three of them do we have a clear methodology of how they talk to participants. Um, and of those three, two were very damaging to the World Bank that the participants didn't feel that the project uh, had a great deal of any sustainability. I was very surprised. I only looked at DFID and NORAD, and I know there are people from Sweden and Finland on the call. I'm sure you probably have them, but I, I haven't been able to find more than one for each of these large organizations. And I already talked about 3IE. Lori? Hi. Hi. So, so I think what we're talking about here in the, in the, I'm getting an echo. Yandra, can you mute? Is, is the project cycle, which kind of defines our industry, and and how do we exit gracefully? How do local NGOs feel they can continue to work with communities or exit gracefully themselves? And this um, slide, I'm still getting a terrible echo here. Laurie, you are the only person with a microphone on. I just don't know if it's some problem with your system. Um, but if you just carry on speaking slowly, I think we can understand. And I just hope you can work your way through the echo, not too painfully. <laughs> OK, am I the only one hearing it? 
No, no, we can hear it, but I'm managing to understand you if you continue to speak quite slowly. Okay, I'll speak, I'll speak very slowly. Um, what this slide is showing is pretty much the project cycle in a linear format. And I think development assistance is, has evolved to the point where we do very rigorous monitoring and evaluation until we hit exit, which is that green up and down line. And as Yindra said, then, then things drop off considerably. And what we don't know is what happens next. So what we're proposing is that we need to understand what goes on after the project finishes. And this is so relevant for exit because we need to kind of look back to the beginning and say, what could have we done when we started? And I think Chris alluded to this and some of your comments as well. What could we have done from the beginning to kind of anticipate what the role of the local agency would be? What kind of resources might be necessary to transition out? And what lessons have we learned from implementation that carried on into the future? So it looks like there's a lot of post projects and some are saying too costly. Okay, an, an issue for conversation. Um, so just as I said, returning post project is so important to understand how sustainable things were, but also what's a, what carried on and what didn't. And, and it's not always the same as what you look at it in an evaluation at the end of a project where the resources have just stopped flowing. And it also makes aid more accountable to participants. In the, in the evaluations we've just finished, people so appreciated um, people coming back and saying, how are you doing now? What's going on now? There's a great report supported by USAID and done by Tufts University, which identifies kind of four pillars of good exit, which is availability of resources, linkages, which goes back very much to what Chris referred to in terms of government relationships, relationships between CSOs and INGOs, the capacity to carry on and the motivation. And this can be, look very different in different contexts. And I'm sure all of you will resonate this with this um, in your own context. So just to say a word about valuing voices, um, our focus is threefold. First of all, promoting more post-project evaluation and really looking at what kind of indicators we can put in place that can measure that throughout the project cycle and beyond. More funding for post-project evaluation, and I'm happy to say the U.S. government has just passed into law a requirement that more post-project evaluations be carried out. And of course, this will help us look back at exit strategies or lack thereof, but what, what can we learn about project phase out? And then generating a larger evidence base. I think um, valuing voices may have the, the repository and of post-project evaluations, but I can see from the comments that are coming up in the chat box, that there's a lot more. And bringing that all together would be so valuable for our sector. And then bringing local evaluators into this conversation more front and center so that there's a, the local capacity and knowledge base to kind of inform um, the civil society sector and government in terms of what's appropriate for aid dynamics and aid phase out. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and so we're going to talk about two, uh, several case studies. One of the one of the joys of doing this. So one of the frightening things of doing this is that um, post projects, uh, you know, 
someone at somebody who's very knowledgeable about post project we were meeting in a small group there were eight of us and he said it was the largest group of people ever gathered together to talk about post project in the world um, I may have the only repository of post project evaluation across you know gathering data across donors and, and that's just staggering to me so we're hoping to change this because such lessons are incredibly important for design, for implementation. The funding has to be based on what people could self-sustain. So there was a terrific, terrific project by CRS in Niger. Um, the reasons for successful exit and really terrific results, and we didn't, uh, we can, there's more on the blog at Valuing Voices, is um, a partner for exit two years before closeout. They partnered with governments, they had very simple indicators, they partnered with communities, they partnered with their local partners, and they said, how do we exit for this to be sustainable? 80% um, of the project activities were self-sustained three years afterwards. In large part, that was because the government knew enough about the project that they could try to allocate ongoing government funds to put up, to, to fill the gap once CRS left. The communities were supported in creating private sector linkages to those that were supposed to purchase the, the, uh, the crops afterwards. There was a very thoughtful exit, so I suggest you guys look at that on the blog. Um, there is a danger of donors and um, partners designing unsustainable activities. Some of them were in environment where um, there was a road reconstruction, there were food, most of these were food assisted activities. So it's a food for work, food for assets, that once the food was taken away, there's very little incentive for people to continue um, doing that. There's no self-generated incentive. Even literacy, shockingly, was uh, did not continue. Um, the really important, one really important lesson is that youth involvement has to be there over the long term. Uh, many of the activities were kind of headed by older people, the more senior people in the villages, and unless there is uh, ongoing involvement uh, in, by you know, youth, youth being you know, 20 to 35, um, you really question the real sustained uh, continuation of some of the knowledge change in health, some of the best practices in agriculture, they have to be involved. Um, There's a second project uh, also from Niger for LWR that I did many years ago in evaluation. And um, unexpected emerging outcomes showed up in a very shockingly wonderful way. Um, please read the blog in the, on the website, searched by LWR, but the, the essence of it is, wow, there's a wonderful food security project that's being funded. Uh, it had to do with drought rehabilitation and there were benefits of so giving sheep and fodder and uh, putting in wells for food security and resilience. Our lens was too narrow. The very last village, women said to me during the evaluation, as I was walking to the vehicle, oh, and our husbands don't beat us anymore. Now that we have animals, now that we have water and we can be home and not spend every other day traveling eight hours, walking eight hours to and from getting water. So we look too narrowly at our expectations of projects. We miss amazing results like this that we went back and into. Ethiopia and Kenya were both kind of lessons from during implementation. Um, communities, we've come to see, again, these are blogs on the site. Um, communities know best what to monitor. It's very clear. They gave us wonderful indicators in Ethiopia of what they felt the Red Cross, Red Crescent, could actually monitor during implementation that boded well for the sustainability of activities. Communities could check each other's responses if it was publicly monitored. Um, participants, and you know, they know what they could self-sustain. There were um, the very large tip items, such as uh, cows for milk and bulls for traction while um, donors really wanted this and the government really wanted this. People said we don't have the means to self-sustain it. If that cow dies, all we have is the loan and they're very much indebted. If you give us loans for chickens and goats, that we can, you know, that we can self-sustain ourselves. That's replicable. So it's just lots of really interesting design questions came out of that. 
Uh, Ruterica Gendo, one of our evaluators, wrote this very, very interesting blog on our site this uh, this month that talked about, you know, can women self-sustain budgets better than men? Um, she seemed to see a lot of evidence that in Kenya, and also, you know, why something failed can almost be more valuable than why it succeeded. And one of the surprising, so we take an appreciative inquiry approach, looking at what succeeded and how do we do more of it. But we've been told by several people in the post-project evaluation, you know, small hidden group of us, that there are several um, organizations that have not published theirs because the results were so damning. The results were uh, showed such unsustainability, and I just encourage people to publish exactly what they're finding because we can learn as much, if not more, from what didn't work. Over to you, Lori. Hi. So um, I just want to respond to the question that Rachel just posted to, to make sure that we're framing this right. I'm still getting an echo. Are you guys all hearing this? No, the echo seems better. to be gone for me. Oh, but... I changed. I changed headphones. Good. Okay, I'm but hearing look... it, but I'll cope. Just to say, um, the the difference, the the big distinguishing factor between end of project and post project is time. When projects finish, there's still a lot going on, and to look back at did we achieve our objectives or did were there unexpected outcomes. All of those questions are important and relevant, but in terms of sustainability, it's impossible to predict unless you let the project fade away and come back later and, and ask your questions. So that's what we're focusing on. Um, I just want to talk about a, um, evaluation that we're just finishing up, and we haven't given been given permission to um, share it. But there were some very clear lessons. This was a food for peace project. Um, in terms of the assumptions that were made about handover and about exit, which I think are very common in development assistance, which is, and Chris also alluded to it, the government will pick it up. They'll pick up the extension services, they'll support local initiatives with credit, with other social services. And that's often unrealistic. Either the government doesn't share that commitment or they're ca cash strapped, or it hasn't really been negotiated. In this case, there were sort of a ceremonial handover. Everyone enjoyed themselves. The donor went away and a lot of things fell by the wayside. Um, in terms of group formation, what we learned was it takes time. And the local agency, with all their good intentions, without the resources to continue, can't support that process. So it needs to be anticipated in the design. And often we know a lot about that from the context, from other agencies, from the local agencies. Um, experience. And then finally, and I think we're all familiar with this, is the project cycle itself, which kind of determines the cycle of presence. How long can a local agency stay in a community without support to continue their work, particularly if they weren't dependent on volunteers to start? I think there's a big difference between a local NG, NGO and a CSO in that regard. So finally, we had a few questions for you. And looks like you've got lots of questions, too, for us and for each other. Um, first of all, where have you seen post-project sustainability after project exit? And what did we do right? What did you do right? What were the, the agencies you were evaluating doing right? And what can we learn from what didn't work out so well? And what are the barriers to, to, to looking at eggs from the beginning? Why isn't this part of development 
practice? And what can we do about it? So those are some pretty big questions and I think I'll leave it there. Rachel, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Laurie and Yindra. Yes, you are right. There is a lot of questions coming through on the chat. So um, perhaps we can give you a couple of um, minutes just to sort of flick your way through those um, questions from Lydia, from my Maija, Liliana, Domit, Ali. Um, yeah, so perhaps have a quick look at those. Take your pick. Uh, we could also um, ask if there are uh, people who want to put up their hand and ask a question directly. So just a few seconds for you to have a think and then decide perhaps how, how you want to respond between the two of you. Sure, so I just wanted to say I'm, you know, as, as, the, as the creator of the repository, I'm just particularly delighted that people are willing to share theirs with us. I mean, we really want to shout out and say, look at what our industry's already done. Isn't this great? Let's learn. Let's do a comparison of methodologies. Let's look across the results, right? I'm just so excited to see some more kind of coming out of the, out of the shrubs. Um, and so I'm just, I've just been taking, you know, screenshots, you know, in this acquisitive way. Um, Laurie, is there a question you want to deal with as I just sit in happiness at learning about <laughs> more of what's out there? <laughs> no, but I, I would love to hear from some of the agencies who are saying they've done this because it's not, apparently not in, in on the web um, and what they've learned. All right, so um, if you could just both switch off your microphone for a second, because we are starting to get some feedback, Laurie and Yindra. I'm going to ask Agnes if she would, because she's raised her hand, if she would like to speak. So Agnes, could you switch on your microphone and go ahead? Um, thank you very much for that opportunity. It is very important that we are discussing a very important topic. And I like the questions that are related to uh, where have we witnessed, um, you know, projects that are sustainable beyond the project implementation and when people have exited from uh, an area? My question was uh, um, probably the levels at which we are looking at the exits. Um, and I was thinking of maybe um, one is the level of program, like a project linked to an exit after a project ends then a post uh, project evaluation is carried out. And uh, at the same time, uh, before ending the project, you leave uh, an exit you know, plan in place. Uh, and the other thing is uh, I was thinking um, exit that is uh, linked with the presence of uh, um, an, organizations, uh, an organization in a particular area or country where they have been supporting development or humanitarian initiatives. So maybe um, probably um, if the, the two are linked, then you find that you, there is a likelihood of having um, more kind of better results because the practice of planning for exit is imbued within the ongoing programs yeah, and at the, at, at the same time, you um, within the organizational uh, kind of um, strategy plan, uh, probably that also needs to be well thought out. And I like the idea of the CAFOD, the CRI's uh, example of saying that they have like a, a time frame of at least two years to be able to exit from a given country. And um, um, I, I work for CAFOD, Catholic Agency for Overseas Development. And uh, remember, we exited our programs from Tanzania. And uh, the exit process took a whole uh, three year time frame. And we left in place some plans of still continuing to hold relationships with our partners there. And if need be, you know, being able to come in and provide um, support. Uh, uh, on ad hoc basis, should the a situation of uh, dire need arise. So I think that is the comments that I wanted to make. Thank you. 
Um, okay, Agnes, thank you very much. Um, so, Yindra, Laurie, I'm going to ask you to sort of respond to that, but I also want to pick up on a sort of group of questions that we've seen in the chat box. Uh, Agnes, could you switch your microphone off, please? Um, there's been a group of questions asking about the time frame and thinking about, right. you know, what's the ideal time, but also the problem of attribution if you can't yep. go back a long time after exit. Thanks. Absolutely. So I just want to say one thing. I mean, Rachel started this um, this webinar by talking about three different kinds of exit, the country, the project and the partners. And so we're very much focused to date on just the project exit. How do we, you know, kind of what do we learn about uh, post project two to seven years after closeout? We find that going back earlier than two years, it still gets confounded by the project inputs going back a bit farther than seven years, it gets a bit difficult for people to remember. Although I'm about to go to another country in Africa and do an evaluation of a project that closed 16 years later, right? So we'll see how, how effective that is. Um, but uh, certainly where the partner is still local, they still have the opportunity to direct future linkages, future partnerships to those same communities. The difficulty uh, we heard about in a couple of the post projects is that donors come in with prefixed ideas. As Chris had said, in terms of the exit, it's almost like a cut and paste, but people will sometimes cut and paste, oh, you know, we did this project in another country, let's just go do it there, rather than looking at what is what was implemented earlier in the country, what was self-sustained, which is a key variable to what should be built on. Um, what, yeah. So, Laurie, do you want to add something to that? Oh, and the attribution thing, we spend a lot of time trying to do not attribution, but at least contribution. We have to map out and we find areas that are to the best of our ability um, with limited involvement from other INGOs that are in the same areas to try and isolate the particular project. And Laurie can talk more about doing comparison groups and things like that. And I just want to say, I'm so sorry about this echo. On Agnes's point, I think what you're talking about is a great deal of flexibility and continuity that is probably fundamental for good exit. And I really like your idea of using the final evaluation to inform that as well, to, to inform good exit. Sort of what else is there to do? I don't think all donors um look at their project cycle that way so it's like okay it's july 1st we said we were finished goodbye um and i think that's critical to this conversation in terms of attribution i mean the same issue is relevant in the end of project evaluation it just gets way more complicated in a post project and we can mitigate that a little bit by anticipating at the very beginning of the project, hey, we're gonna come back in 10 years. What kind of data might be helpful for us to be able to kind of look back? So, so sort of building the data set from day one of the project would be hugely helpful. That's not always a luxury we have. So we have to really manage our methodologies and triangulate like mad. Okay, would you like to sort of take a, another look at a couple of the, some of the questions that are coming in the box? Yeah, absolutely. There's youth is a thing that's coming up over and over again. I mean, one of the, one of our recommendations um, on, on, the, on the one project where the youth seem to be a particular issue is that um, one must, one absolutely must involve um, the you know 20 to 35 somethings to be involved just in terms of feeling that the project is theirs. They may not have been the prime participants, but unless they are involved in the reporting of it, the managing of uh, you know kind of any of these you know we always have this myth of the um, the groups that are going to sustain um, uh, the assets, the activities, the training, and in many places where the activities we found, at least in food security projects that I've evaluated, where the activities are most rentable, where they're most um, profitable to the community, they will continue to meet. 
But unless we continue to have people that are training five years later, 10 years later, some of the best practices, I really doubt if we return to some of these projects that are short-term profitable, let's see how much in the long-term they continue to be. And I want to quote, I pointed people to that um, exit strategies um, for USA. They have a wonderful example where at the end of project, um, there is a very, there were two projects, project A, project B. Project A seemed very successful at the end of project, project B less so. When they went back three years later, project B was more successful than project A. It was more durable, it was more sustainable. So we need to look at post-project and compare it to end of project and really learn those lessons. That's it for me, right? Okay, um, so then I'm going to ask Juan Dile to, um, to speak, if that's okay. Uh, could both, y Yindra, could you just switch off your microphone while Juan, Juan Dile is speaking? Hello? Yep, go ahead, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, mine is just a, a slight, uh, a small comment there. I'd like to just say that many a times I notice that as organizations, we tend to concentrate more on the processes and the activities, and we cease to look at the impact that they have. But at the same time, we have to notice that we really cannot sustain something that we haven't achieved. So I think that goes to show how important still the process and the activities are. So we work with young people and we've seen that as a way of ensuring that impact is there, even post project, the use of social media can go a long way. It's affordable and it's efficient in most cases. So social media can be used as well. And also trying to build the capacity of the beneficiaries so that they're able to ensure continuity and to retain the gains has also helped. And that also ensures that the project is also community owned. So if it's community owned, it's easier to sustain the impact. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I just want to jump up and down for a minute. That was an early dream. Our wonderful ICT for D person on our team said, Oh my God, I want to partner with Ushahidi. I want to get crowdsourced data on the results of projects. If there's any donor that is willing to support this, I'd be beyond delighted. Lori, do you have something else to add? No, I like it too. Okay, are there any other sort of points that you feel have come through in the chat that you would like to respond to? I think there was an interesting point from Mary. I think she has now left the session, but there's an interesting point that she made about whether or not, you know, your, your mapping of these fails to capture some of the um, activities that organizations actually do, but they call them something else like learning exercises, um, for example. Do you have a comment on your methodology perhaps for bringing together these evaluations? So, so Laurie's probably going to say something, but I just need to say the taxonomy issue is massive. People tell me all the time, oh no, I, you know, we just call it something else. I mean, for me, that is such a crime, right? We've been searching by ex post and post project. Um, I'm delighted to gather any more taxonomies that people would like to tell us to search by. Um, but it's the learning from it. I mean, one of the things that I find in our, the beautiful program cycle that we presented is that very often we don't learn from final evaluations before we do the next design. Imagine if we can learn not only from final evaluations, but also from post-project evaluations to inform the next funding cycle and the design. That is one of my greatest desires. That's a response to my job um, in terms of learning and funding evaluations. I don't know if anyone has any suggested suggestions other than the value one to do it and the organizations find how incredibly valuable it is, what fascinating lessons there are. Um, that's just, that's the best proof is to do one. Lori, do you have something to add? No, I, I think it's a really important point and something that needs to be looked at sort of from an OD point of view. Like what are the indicators that point to a learning organization? Because it's one thing to go through the motions of doing a post project but if you don't sort of say, okay, some of this was good, some of this wasn't so great, what can we learn? And, and how is it relevant for the next 
cycle. Okay, well, I think we'll um, bring that sort of session to a close um, at the moment so we can move on to sort of a final, more open discussion where we can bring together some of the comments and the points and questions that we've had from earlier. Um, you know, I am aware that a lot of our participants are actually located to the east of both um, our speakers in the States and ourselves in the UK. Um, and it's now sort of heading way into the evening. Um, however, we would like to have a little bit um, more time for a bit of an open discussion. Now, there have been plenty of questions that have been brought up. Um, and um, perhaps, um, there are one or two people who would like to sort of make sure that they make their points heard. So I have also put a couple of additional sort of questions up on the slides here just to sort of prompt a little bit of thinking um, as, as we go forward. But um, I mean, Chris, I wonder if you would um, like to sort of come back in again, um, just now that you've had a chance to sort of hear what uh, Laurie and Yindra were saying and perhaps had a chance to engage with some of the other questions that were coming up and see if there's anything else that you'd like to say. Um, and anybody else who's in the room, please feel free to put your hand up or jump up and down in the chat box so that we can uh, make sure that we come to your, your point um, now. Laurie, can you switch your microphone off, please? Thanks, Rachel. Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank Laurie and Jindra for their, for their presentation. Um, I think that what I was seeing in Vietnam was sort of the front end uh, of the exit process, um, looking at organizations kind of just starting to experience the exit process and just starting to develop their strategies for managing it, at least the local organizations starting to develop their strategies. The international donors, of course, had their strategies in place. Um, and certainly in collaboration with people in Vietnam, I, I developed uh, a certain sense for what was going to happen, how things would unfold. But in order to really know what strategies are most effective, you've got to uh, go and see the outcomes. And so it, I think the things that valuing voices in, is encouraging and supporting um, are certainly crucial. And I haven't looked at uh, the repository that you all discussed, but I, I made a note to myself that it's something that I want to look at soon. So I don't have too much to add um, in reaction to what you've said, other than that, that the research that you're doing seems to be like a really crucial part of improving the policy process. So thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, um, I want to come back to a question that was raised by Clara um, much earlier on in the webinar. I don't know if Clara is still with us and would like to sort of make the point. Um, and it was a question about accountability in the context of aid withdrawal. Um, Clara, are you there? And do you have a microphone? Are you able to sort of speak to your, your point? Okay, it would seem that Clara isn't kind of doesn't maybe doesn't have a microphone, but um, I'm just going to see if I can find my way back to the point. So I think it was a point that Clara was making quite early on in the webinar about um, sort of accountability mechanism mechanisms and principles that that can be used for um, uh, for for um, withdrawing resources, particularly when there is very short notice or when no exit strategy is in place. And I think that this is a really, personally, I'm gonna, you know, I think this is a really interesting point because um, I think the reality is from our understanding is, and what we've heard about already today is that this sort of can sometimes happen without people being really honestly prepared for it, however long they've been engaged in a project or a program or in a partnership in particular, particularly where it's been sort of a long standing issue. And um, in our experience at Intrac, there are many organizations that you know have good principles for their partnerships, good principles for relationships, but they haven't necessarily translated into principles for exit. However, um, you know, we sort of strongly, of course, we would sort of strongly advocate that we need um, to be um, you know, you need to be thinking from the very outset of any intervention or any relationship what the long term sort of strategy and plan is and particularly from the perspective that we have, what is the long term um, what is the long term purpose in the support that you're providing to that partner and how can you help them to be sustainable and have long term um, sort of impact? Yeah. So, um, but we also know that, you know, you, what you do if you suddenly find yourself in a situation, you don't have any principles. Well, you know, I think you can rest assured that many other organizations have been through this as well. And our experience is that you can actually 
you can, whatever stage you are in the process, even if you're, you know, ideally you're not going to exit quite yet when you suddenly realize you're going to, and you've got time to do some good planning, but you can also stop at whatever moment and just really think about how you want to do it, even if you're only a few months away from exit. So, you know, there are ways to, to, to end well, and we would encourage people to look at some of the resources we've produced to, to, to think about that process. I think Chris also has something to say on this. So, um, Chris, would you want to come in? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, this was something that uh, that we discussed when we did the uh, the USIP workshop. And honestly, I think that it's a problem that is probably exacerbated when local civil society seems less sustainable, or when local civil society has gotten heavily distorted by a big influx of donor funding, like in a post-conflict or a post-disaster situation, um, where basically, if you have a lot of NGOs that you don't think have um, strong, a strong grassroots basis such that they will be able to sustain themselves after they're gone. Um, basically what donors said is that they're afraid of informing those sorts of NGOs about uh, upcoming withdrawal because they recognize that those organizations are already kind of rent-seeking organizations. And so they think, if we, are, if we inform our local NGO partners about the fact that we're going to be gone in six months or 12 months, they're going to stop doing all of the project work that they've been contracted to do, and they're just going to siphon that money off um, because they know that they're going to be losing their funding and they're going to sort of, um, you know, maximize, maximize their takings while, they, while there's still an opportunity to do that. Um, and so the thing that I'd say that that points to is that actually some of the accountability mechanisms or principles that, uh, that uh, I think donors in particular need to adhere to are not the accountability mechanisms associated with aid reduction or exit, they're actually accountability mechanisms associated with aid arrival and entry. Um, that, uh, that there has to be a conscientious effort to cultivate partners that have a sufficient grassroots basis that you believe that they can be sustainable even once your money goes out. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself dealing with people that on the back end you don't trust. Um, and as a result, you're not willing to share transparently with them about your exit plans. Okay, does, um, does anybody else have a, a question, burning question um, or I, comment that they would like to I make? actually do. Yeah, oh, I actually so, do hold if on, I can. Hold on a minute, let oh. me just get Chris to switch off his microphone. So I'm just so curious. I mean, one of the things that this question of post-project sustainability begs is, um, country-led development. I mean, how much are we actually designing, and it came up in Chris's presentation as well, for countries to become self-sufficient, for uh, us to design projects that country resources can sustain, that, um, that countries are capable of monitoring themselves. So in terms of these, you know, sustainable development goals and, and the, all the hoopla around it, for those folks in Africa, Asia, Latin America that are on the call. Could you tell me any thoughts on how well we do that? I don't know if anybody would like to sort of take up the challenge from Yindra there. I mean, Yindra, one thing I note, you're sort of talking about designing sort of countries to be self-sufficient. And obviously a country is made up of many, many different aspects. Um, I think a lot of the people in this in this room are sort of thinking about their own organizations, their own impacts in particular sort of small sectors um, uh, and whatever. But uh, yeah, does anybody want to come in and take up the challenge from Yindra? Or even their own sectors, you know, to be able to be free of, you know, foreign aid, how well has foreign aid catalyzed that capacity? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody taking up your challenge, Yindra. Maybe it's something that we have to, you know, people might want to go away and um, sort of muse on. <laughs> um, you know, I do think that, you know, that for Chris's, Chris's example was sort of extremely, you know, it was just extremely clear and giving us a sense of the multiple different ways in which um, of different actors in the equation in you know think about what sustainability might be or the sustainability of their interventions and the diff you know that the need for us to differentiate between those types of actors um so yeah i think it's um 
you know, and I think, yeah, and we see that Heather's just written something in the chat there, you know, very much. It's sort of, it kind of depends, doesn't it? It depends who's designing it and what are the objectives and all these different actors are going to have different things that they would want to see sustained. I mean, one of the biggest concerns, you know, and issues that, that INTRAC is interested in is, you know, how do civil society organizations and individual actors in civil society sustain themselves when they are working on things that the government does not want them to be working on? I mean, that is the group that is often at the most, finding it the most hard to find alternative ways of funding um, their, their activities. So, I mean, both, I think both, it was sort of Chris's examples looking at a at health sector, um, you know, our experience is that in some environments, if you're working in some of the more service oriented environments, then perhaps there are alternative sources of funding that are um, that are easier to, to access. But if you're working on some of the perhaps more tricky human rights related issues or advocacy issues, it is often it's much more tricky to sort of sustain some of those initiatives, particularly if um, other actors, whether they're private sector or state, are not particularly keen for those activities um, to continue. Um, right, I'm, I shouldn't hog the microphone because of having the moderator rights, but <laughs> I, I see Gideon saying, you know, well-planned exit would help with much of this. And I think that's precisely the challenge that we're putting out there to the sector is what can we learn from the interest that we've had in this webinar and in the discussions that we're having to, to maybe do that planning, all of us, a little bit better. So um, it's perhaps worth thinking about bringing this to a close. Um, however, I am very, um, I'm very keen to, to allow anybody else to come in uh, who would like to, to, to raise a point. Um, Yindra, would you like to, to respond um, in person to some of these points that you've just seen in the chat box? Oh, well, I'm, I'm just delighted, folks. You know, I mean, it, really questioning who's leading the development process. I mean, um, Lori has a beautiful graphic somewhere on our site where, you know, we, so often we're accountable. Our clients are our donors. Our clients are not our participants and partners. And so teaming up with Rachel at Intrac just, you know, made us so happy, right, to work on this uh, issue together, different pieces of it. Uh, because so often, you know, the... It's what the, what, the, what the money is for. We see funds earmarked for certain activities because that's what's popular in the donor countries, not necessarily the need in the, in the um, recipient countries. And, but it's getting better. I mean, I, I wanna end on a positive note. I mean, we're seeing the international aid transparency initiative sharing data on what the projects have done. We're seeing the sustainable development goals, you know, kind of collaborating on what can countries learn from monitoring these indicators themselves, capacity building in the evaluation community among the BOPES, the national evaluation associations. I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot more crowdsourcing. I think the internet and mobile technology is completely transforming. The feedback loops are now available from all sorts of directions on how, um, how you know, kind of what what's happening? Are there? Does the well work? Does you know? Has the tractor broken down? So I think we're just at the early edge of seeing a great deal more feedback, especially from the young, about what's working well and what's the world they want uh, to live in. And if people get more politically active, we see just a lot more um, activity in making development local. So I'll stop. But I'm just. I think we're in a we're, we're heading in the right direction, hopefully. I mean, I think that Wim is raising a very important point, which, you know, I, I sort of sh would like to share your optimism. And I think the optimism comes from seeing people starting to think about sustainability and to think about exit. But I think one of the reasons we're thinking about it is precisely because a lot of organizations, whether on the sort of intermediary side or the local side or the donor side, are suddenly facing quite big challenges in the funding environment. And it's forcing sort of a moment of, of anxiety and disruption as well. So, you know, what we're hoping the positive that we can all contribute to this is to help um, people to navigate this process and much better. Can I just ask, Frederick, you put up your hand and then you put it down again. Uh, Frederick, did you want to come in? I shall take silence. Oh, I'll take silence as a no. Um, so I think we're coming to, to the end of our time. Um, can I just ask my colleague, Dan, is there any other questions that you've spotted that you really think we should um, 
try and tackle before we no okay so i'm going to um just perhaps share with with everybody a couple of next steps i'm starting to see things being thrown into the chat box about you know wouldn't it be great to continue discussing this point or that point and potential topics for for next uh next webinars um and things like that so i think that's really you know it really is very exciting to see the discussion in the chat and i think i hope all of you um have uh, sort of really found this a very useful learning experience and we will certainly be going away um, and having a really good think about um, the interest that you've shown and all of the comments um, that have come through and consider how do we um, move forward from here. Um, in terms of our, um, our own personal next steps, um, we, you know, as you know, we've already shared presentations with those of you who um, signed up to the webinar. We have, as I said at the start, recorded this session and we will share that link with um, all of the people who signed up because there were many who said, you know, they were very interested but couldn't come today. So we'll be sharing that. Um, but I'm also thinking about how we can build something more um, from what we've been we've been talking about now. I mean, both in track and valuing voices and um, uh, Chris's, Chris and his colleagues at Kennesaw, we are all actively seeking partners to advance um, ideas uh, around this area of work to, you know, advance a program of work in both capacity building, research and evaluation in this area. Um, we're also actively seeking funding partners for this as well, um, because we think there's a huge amount that we could do to support organisations better through this process and find good tools and systems that will allow us to really try to achieve some of what, what I see as, as, as the gaps that emerge from this process, which is what happens next? How can you support organisations to be sustainable? How can you support interventions better in ways that ensure that there is something left behind? And if there's nothing left behind, that's perhaps because the need isn't there anymore. But we're also aware that there are great needs and we would like to see if we can do something more and something better. We are really particularly interested in working with local partners, you know, um, sort of local organizations, the partners who have experienced this exit process to understand better what would work for them and how they could, um, you know, what, what can we do to give them more power in the, the, the process vis-a-vis -vis their funding partners so that they can ask for a better and more responsible exit process as well. So we're very keen to design ideas around that. So I'm wondering about, um, because it's been such a big group, is to circulate a short online survey after this webinar um, and ask people to just respond to a few short questions to give us a sense of what you think would be particularly interesting ways to pursue um, these questions. What are the big questions that we should be pursuing? Um, and also to give us an indication of your interest in participating in this um, sort of wider initiative as well. Um, so um, I have sort of said all that I really desperately need to say. I wonder if either um, either of the, the speakers would like to have um, a final word before we bring things to a final close. So Chris, do you want to say anything before we close? Just thank you very much for setting this up, Rachel. It's been my pleasure to participate. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Laurie? Um, yeah, me too. But I just want to say too, I've, I've been working in this field almost 50 years and it's really great to see so much interest from the field um, on this subject. Maybe we can get some traction finally. And Yindra? I've said so much. Thank you, everyone. Delighted. Okay, well, thank you to our, I would like to say a big thank you to the speakers, of course, because they're the ones who put in all the, the work in, in, in these presentations as well. And thank you to my colleagues at Intrac for helping with the technology dimensions. And of course, a very, very big thank you to all of you who have participated and given up sort of time from your evenings, your mornings, your lunch times, whatever time of day it is with you. Um, and you know, we look forward to continuing um, this journey with you. So thank you very much um, and goodbye.